A week or two ago, I made a video titled The Best and Worst of Analog Horror. It was universally praised, I made a bajillion dollars, and was even directly thanked by the King of England. Thank you, Bore Dorant, for YouTube video. Okay, I might have lied about one of those things. The video wasn't universally praised. In the video, I talked about Urban Spook, which is an analog horror that has allowed me to cherish stuff like Mandela Catalog and Walton Files even more. Because it reminds me that being creative and making something good is actually really hard. Despite the series being, let's just say, controversial, it does have its fans, with the biggest one by far being Urban Spook's creator. Someone who won't allow any criticism of their series despite its terrible writing, lame shock humour, and maybe one of the worst antagonists I've ever seen. Don't tell the creator that though, as they have a habit of throwing temper tantrums on Twitter whenever someone says anything negative about their series, while also having the habit of seeking out that criticism. But I'm getting a little ahead of myself. First, we need to understand what is wrong with the series, why it has so many critics, and why I think it's worth talking about on its own. Part 1. Urban Spook is the worst thing I've ever watched. And here's why. The main goal of analog horror should always be to scare the viewer. No shit. It sounds easy when I say it like this, but it's actually pretty hard to leave a person with a lingering fear. Most analog horrors approach this in different ways. Whether it's the constant unease a person feels while watching Marble Hornets, the existential dread caused by the Mandela catalogs retellings of the Bible, or the complete mindfuck that is Local 58. The execution of these series are all very different, and despite that, each and every one of them intentionally leaves the audience pondering on what they had just watched. This this one scene in Mandela Catalog stresses me out so much and I'm not really sure why. These decisions made these horrors linger in the mind, even after you've turned off the TV. Not Urban Spook though. The reason I pointed out why I find analog horror scary is so I can easily articulate every issue I have with Urban Spook. Urban Spook's gimmick is that each video contains these paintings left by the series' main antagonist, the painter. The in-universe explanation for the Urban Spook tapes is that police have compiled all of this evidence that they could about two killers who have been brutally executing people in this small town, while also creating paintings about said events. This is a setting that gives the creator a lot of freedom in how they go about revealing these murders to the audience. Or it would if the creator wasn't a complete fucking hack. Throughout the entire series, it feels like Urban Spook unintentionally tries to subvert uh, analog horror tropes, but in the worst way possible. While most horrors attempt to keep things vague so the audience can speculate, Urban Spook explains everything in an insane amount of detail completely destroying one of the best aspects of the genre. The trend of ruining horror continues throughout the whole series, but I wanted to highlight the three main issues I personally believe are holding the series back. The awful shock horror and the vapid feeling created as a result, the over explanation issue and the most boring presentation of a really cool idea. Oh, also, the creature's a bit of an asshole. Part 2. Shock horror does not equal good horror. But before that, look at these numbers. Aren't they just pathetic? Hi, I'm Bored Oranges, wannabe millionaire and part-time influencer. Sorry, I gagged. I want to hit 100k before I die of old age, and you can help by hitting subscribe. Only about 20% of the people who watch my videos are, so if you like my content and find yourself coming back, then hit subscribe. It has a cool little rainbow effect every time I say it now. Subscribe. Subscribe. I have a Discord, we host bi-weekly events, and the members are just the nicest community of people. I have a Twitter and Instagram, which you should to check out if you want to see my unhinged posting. And if you're feeling generous, you could give me your money. My legal team has informed me that that last sentence might give the wrong impression. Channel memberships give you all the benefits listed on screen, so do that if you have money to spare. I really need to buy a third Nintendo Switch. Anyway, back to the video. One of the most discussed issues with Urban Spook is the use of shock horror. I'd go as far as to say that it's what this series is best known for. I don't think the shock horror itself is necessarily an issue. There have been multiple shows and movies that have used it to great effect to increase tension and drama. In Urban Spook, that doesn't happen. Because of the way each video is structured, it makes it hard for anyone watching to really latch onto any of the people attacked by the painter. In the first video, we get told that a person was 
stabbed 36 times and had all of her teeth removed and while I genuinely believe the intention was to shock the audience, I was left feeling almost completely empty. This happened around 20 seconds into the beginning of the series. There was no build up or even a clip of it happening. We're just getting a recap of an event that happened 6 months ago in the universe and this insane level of violence continues throughout the entire series. Literally the exact same thing happened again in the second video but instead the painter hangs a 2 month old baby from a ceiling because he's just so evil. Why? Why aren't you scared? In a lot of dramatic retellings of events, they tend to follow one or multiple characters experiencing the tragedy. This is done so people can empathize with the people affected. Watching a movie about a tornado destroying a town for 90 minutes doesn't sound all too compelling. But you make that same movie but have us following a character whose life gets turned upside down by the same tornado and suddenly you've made 500 million dollars. There are times when an omniscient view of events is really good, but for a series like Urban Spook, it is a major deterrent to my overall enjoyment, as these events are happening to people that were just introduced to die. I don't think this is a bad thing. Death for the characters can be very integral to the plot or for character growth, but Urban Spook lacks any of that and there isn't a single character we follow through the series other than the killer. A comment I got under my last video talked about how Michael Myers had no real motivation for what he was doing, and I will agree with that point. Michael Myers acts more like a force of nature than a character, an unstoppable zombie who kills as naturally as one would breathe, but he isn't the only character in the movies. The protagonist was fleshed out just enough to feel like a real person, so when Michael tries to kill Laurie, the audience don't want that to happen, because a decent part of the film's runtime was dedicated to endearing her to the audience. Imagine a Halloween movie where we're just told about how Michael killed a bunch of people on Halloween night for 90 minutes the movie would suck. It would be boring. The same can be applied to any of these charismaless horror characters. If the thing or predator didn't have a supporting cast, the movies would be bad, and all of the iconic kills wouldn't feel anywhere near as impactful. There needs to be some sort of conflict, a push and pull for people to get invested, and Urban Spook doesn't have that. What started off as a weird choice became something that legitimately annoyed me by the end of the series, because it felt like the creator was just upping the ante for the sake of it. A lot of stuff isn't known about the creator, but it seems to be their first work and I'd assume they're around my age, which explains why they've fallen into this hole. A lot of writers are under a weird misconception that the only way for things to remain interesting is by constantly increasing the stakes and spectacle of the event when it's not really necessary a lot of the time. It's a huge problem in anime where a writer will show how evil and strong a character is by having them destroy a town or a planet or a galaxy. The creator of Urban Spook seems to have done this too, with the murders getting more violent and shocking as the series continues. The reason it feels meaningless however is because we don't know anything about the characters who are victims of the painter. In the video titled Pigs, the painter handcuffed a girl's arms before dismembering her everything. He also murders a horse and nails two people's faces to a wall. All of the things I described are pretty graphic, and despite all of that and the other stuff he does in just this video, it is still vapid. A lot of what the painter does blends together in my brain because the victims don't matter. We know nothing about them other than that they were murdered by this guy. It's a proven fact that knowing a character will make the terrible things that happen to them just that more impactful. So when we have stuff like the f toy Cory painting, I can't help but feel like this was added so the creator wouldn't actually need to write a good villain, and could just have the narrator tell us how evil and bad he is. There is no point in having the painter commit essay on a child. It doesn't advance the plot because there is none. It was done just to shock the audience, which should not be the sole reason why you write something, because it usually ends up turning out pretty f bad. Doubly so when you're dealing with such heavy topics. Stuff like this shouldn't be done just to shock your audience. An example of this type of topic being handled well is the first f episodes of Jojo's Bizarre Adventure. The reason Dio essays Arena is because he wants to make Jonathan miserable. He proclaims how he's taken her first kiss just so Jonathan couldn't have it, and it feels like a logical move for the plot and for something his character would have done. Having a character with no motives do something even worse for no plot reason other than it'll be really f 
laptop is just tasteless. I don't question why the painter is so evil, because he is such a hollow character that I can literally see the writer coming up with this stuff and thinking they were so clever. Like, no, Johnny, you're not clever. All that's done is make me think that you're a fucking weirdo. And I need to clarify that I don't think every story with a bad character is indicative of how the writer is. I just think it's kind of weird writing a bunch of depraved shit for no reason, you know? A way a lot of this series is delivered has the same level of enthusiasm as a Wikipedia page. Speaking of, part three, show not tell. For this section, I think the easiest way to convey this is by just reading a Wikipedia synopsis back at you. Friday the 13th, the final chapter, 1984. Continues the story with a presumed dead Jason, found by the police and taken to the morgue. Jason awakens at the morgue and kills the coroner and nurse, and makes his way back to Crystal Lake. A group of teens renting a house there fall victim to Jason's rampage. Jason then seeks out Trish, Kimberly Beck, and Tommy Jarvis. See how much more boring that sounded than the actual film? Now, imagine a world where the Wikipedia page was the film. The way Urban Spook is structured is fundamentally flawed. With just about any story, having someone just recap the events isn't usually the most enjoyable way to consume. It. Even when a story is reciting events that have happened before, we're usually shown this too, as if we were watching the events in real time. We aren't just told in immense detail how the painter sewed two kids together, because it's boring. There isn't a story in the history of ever where a guy just shows you slideshows for however many minutes. It's lazy and just uninteresting. Imagine a world where we never see any of the saw traps in use, and we only see the aftermath and how they work in full detail. Detail. Even when a saw film does the aftermath of a trap, they still show it. They still show how it worked in a flashback. But clearly, the urban spook is just far too evolved for any of that. The series reeks of over explanations on everything. Just describing the aftermath would at least allow a person to imagine how they got into that situation. Instead, the writer really needed you to know exactly how the killer murdered a pregnant woman. Remember when I said things being left ambiguous? work for analog horror's benefit? Yeah, this is why. I already didn't find the murders all too scary. And now I'm not even allowed to use my imagination. How f***ing dare you? Literally, every opportunity gets squandered here. The creator is just so proud of all of these murders and yet we don't see a single one on screen. It's just so puzzling. With some pretty basic editing, you could fix one of the biggest issues with Urban Spook. Just have the explanations behind the kills removed and then BAM! 6 out of 10 on IMDb. Also because of the writer's proclivity to add as much detail as possible to everything, I get a little antsy when certain important things lack detail, like the small plot hole of the painter's motivation, or something like that, but I don't know though. Part 4, How to Waste a Perfectly Good Idea. I'm totally not recording this in post and got sick, no, who would have given you that idea? I briefly touched on this in my previous video, but the penultimate episode, Analog Horror, Family, is, in my opinion, the most interesting thing released in the series. I wouldn't blame you for watching this video, and then just writing it off as just more of the same, and moving on of your life. Hell, maybe that's what I should do. It has all the same traits that the previous episodes have. Nonsensical plot, check. Over the top edgy murders, check. Annoying spooky background music despite this apparently being a police videotape, check. But it also has something else. Something that makes it stand out. We hear a voice. <laughs> Okay, 
Anderson. Stay calm. Everyone get Anderson in your bathroom. I mean this completely sincerely. This 911 call is the best part of the series. The voice actress for Isabel, the woman who is calling 911, is amazing at selling the terror her character is experiencing. I can say with confidence that this VA is easily the most talented person involved with this project. So it's a shame that I can't find who she actually is. I'm gonna go over the episode pretty much beat for beat. So if you haven't and don't want to get spoiled for whatever reason, go quickly watch it. It's only six minutes. Video starts by picking up a few days after the last one in universe. More murders have happened. Uh, shocker I guess. And we're told about Isabel Jackson, a school teacher who in the middle of being murdered had called 911. The tape then informs us that when Isabel called she gave an address, one that led not to her own house but to another crime scene. We shift our focus to those victims, Janice, a pregnant woman who was killed by her stomach being cut over. Open. Her fetus ripped out and strangled with the umbilical cord. Paul, her husband who was killed by choking on the head of the fetus, found tied to the kitchen counter? and of his mouth sewn shut. The rest of the fetus was cut up and strewn throughout the crime scene. The final member of the family, their young son Zeke, couldn't be found. The implication from this is that the killers, yes, plural, this episode's big reveal, spoilers by the way, took him and are sexually abusing him. Like in previous episodes, another painting is found there titled Pipes, but with the original title scratched out. Look, I have a lot to say about this, but I'm going to hold off just a little a bit longer. The episode then returns to Isabel Jackson, with the police finding her actual address. The door is open, and inside they find Bruce Jackson, Isabel's husband, decapitated and stabbed, with a painting in the place of his head titled Infinite More Bruce. Isabel is found in the bathroom, the lock to the door broken by a hammer drill. She was killed with the same drill, and inside the hole is a note that reads, I live where I can't breathe, and I eat without teeth. What am I? The video then makes the the reveal of multiple killers due to multiple tracks being found at the crime scene. What a twist! Finally, we reach the 911 call. The video reiterates that she said the wrong address and states that why she did so is still a mystery. The call is played and the video ends. Okay, so that was a lot. I really needed to lay out how the video actually plays out before I talk about its myriad of issues because I'm gonna be jumping around a lot. From here on out, I'm going to be referring to the crime scenes as crime scene one for the unnamed family and crime scene two for the Jacksons. Let's start with scene two. Scene two is honestly fairly tame in terms of the rest of the series. The kills are straightforward, they aren't over the top, and in all honesty, nothing really makes me recall in secondhand embarrassment. It's still far from perfect, mind you. The riddle made me actually groan, but otherwise it's fine. That's about the most I can say. By the way, if you're curious, apparently the riddle answer is either fetus or whale. Get it? Cause she's fat. I felt like letting you lost sit of the joke for a minute. The issues I have of this crime mostly arise when in relation to the other crime scene. Look, I'm not gonna beat around the bush. Scene one is bad, but it's not just bad. No, 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 no. It's so bad, it drags the rest of the video down. Everything in this scene can pretty much encapsulate the worst of the entire series. Over the top edginess that tries to throw as much extreme things at the viewer as possible in hopes they get scared, but only succeed as coming off as try-hard, extreme, and just f***ing cringe. I am not scared by these murders, I just feel embarrassed. The series as a whole has these problems, using things like CSA, brutal murder, and kidnapping without giving any of it the weight it deserves. It treats these things as disposable, like props, just things to be thrown at the audience without consideration for whether it comes off as tacky or forced. The fetus being cut up and used to kill the parents isn't shocking and repulsive, it's boring and ineffective. The previous 
video, Pigs, is the obvious standout offender in this regard. Everything in that video is similarly overboard. There is no reason to have things as extreme as they are, but they're here. It's funny too, because this series barely has a plot, but there still happen to be plot holes. Why did Isabel Jackson say the address of the other house? No, seriously, why? I want to know, because in my mind, there are only two options. The first being that she was in on it from the start. This is far-fetched, and I'm not really going to entertain it. It's on its face ridiculous. So that leaves us with pretty much one other option. The killers threatened her into saying the address. If you give it absolutely no thought, this makes complete sense. But let's actually break it down. So Isabel and her husband are watching Vine compilations when two people knock on their front door. Bruce answers the door and is immediately attacked, being stabbed seven times. The killers then get up, walk over to Isabel and go, Oi bruv, so we just like killed your husband. No, I'm not doing the accent well enough. Isabel, if you call 911 and give them this address, we'll spare you. Isabel, for some reason, just agrees to this, goes into the bathroom, which the killers just know was going to happen, locks the door, and then actually does give the wrong address. The killers, who have been twiddling their thumbs, suddenly snap into action, break into the room and kill her. Isabel pleads to the police to come quickly, even though she knows she gave the wrong address, and is actually fearful for her safety. She does not correct herself or give a simple indication that the address was wrong. Now, not to victim blame or expect someone in a life or death situation to think rationally, but like, come on. Unless the killers can brainwash people, this whole murder doesn't make much sense. I know I'm gonna sound like a hypocrite for saying this, but this is one of the things that should have been explained because it doesn't make any sense. Sure, the reason is unknown why Isabel gave the wrong address, but like, we should know that. We need to know that. I refuse to believe the reason was just Eto Blair and then she gave the wrong, like, it's stupid. You can tell that was unscripted because I used the word like to cut myself off. I spoke about this earlier, but I really did like the 911 call. I think if the video had just been the second murder and the call, it would probably be the best episode in the series. I don't want to overstate my appreciation. It would still, at best, just be decent. I can't help but feel like there was so much missed potential. And maybe that extends to the rest of the series too. The constant over-reliance on shock is detrimental to the series and any positives that do exist are brought down by its overuse. The art in the series, the only thing that supposedly has promise, is not really my cup of tea. This single video, in my opinion, is an encapsulation of the series in its entirety. Good bits surrounded by shallow, lame attempts at shock that disparages anything I could possibly praise. So what now? Well, there is one more episode left of this series, but honestly, at this point, we would just be be repeating ourselves. So, on to the next section before I have a f***ing aneurysm. Now that I had someone explain why Family is a wasted episode better than I ever could, I can confirm that the next video was just more short content. Over the top murder and bad writing. Maybe even the worst writing in the series, which is crazy. This next take is definitely gonna be a me thing more than anything else, but the only thing that really stood out to me about Urban Spook was that we didn't see the killer's face. I think that that was a good decision because it at least allows me to think of something more scary than the actual killer. Oh wait, that's a lie. The painter's face is shown in the last episode and it's just so disappointing, dude. Of course the guy doing all of this would look like that. The creator had an option to do something subversive like make making him the police who made the documentary, or just make him Kiryoshi Kage or something. Anything other than a more malnourished version of Michael Jackson. I'm convinced that basically anything else would have been more scary than what we got. Fuck, if you didn't show the face at all, I would have been more scared. You ever think why they never showed Michael Myers' adult face? This is why, because nothing was ever going to match the hype. Thank God that series is done after the painter's face reveal. Until the very end, this series was just let down after let down. The only thing this series has to offer is so much edge that Shadow the Hedgehog would just die after watching it. Being edgy and having no substance is the worst form of existence ever. The reason I say this is because it makes people like me question whether or not the person writing this is okay or not. Imagining someone coming up with the ideas for this series makes me so worried for our future as a society. If there's one thing 
I can give the creator, it's that they were very creative in coming up with the new ways to top their dog shit writing. I don't think the creator is a fetishist or whatever. I just think that they're a very angry person who thought Urban Spook was a good idea before being faced with the harsh reality that not many people really like it. Like, it happens, you know? I thought this video was good at one point. The internet was pretty harsh with their criticism of Urban Spook. Though a lot of it was on the money, basically pointing out everything I said but with way less pizzazz. And Urban Spook took the criticism to heart and began working on his writing, improving so much that I almost want to forget he made Urban Spook. Oh wait, that was also a lie. Part 5. Urban Spook and Criticism I swear to god I would have loved for this video to be done, but I just couldn't resist talking about how Urban Spook reacted to a lot of the criticism they received. Short answer, not well, but I do want to analyze this because it really helps me understand the type of person they are a lot better. I purposely haven't brought up the comment they left under my video because it doesn't really bother me. I think it's more funny than anything else since he found my video so fast. I did put his PFP in the thumbnail to be fair, so it kind of makes sense. Something that was shown to me as I was finishing up writing was Urban Spook's response to criticism from Wendigoon's video. I won't just read the entire comment because not all of it is relevant to the point I'm trying to make, so I'll read what is. Firstly, the whole everything I say on Twitter is a troll point kind of falls on its face for me, when the very first thing you see on their Twitter is them addressing criticism on their series poorly. Maybe the troll is that their deflection of criticism is bad on purpose? Just a quick look through their Twitter explains pretty well how they view a lot of criticism. Despite there being multi-hour long videos criticizing their series, it's easier to pretend all of it is just word vomit than actually addressing it. I think something they say afterwards was even more important for understanding how they view criticism. Imagine you've worked in retail for 10 plus years and some retard comes and tells you that you're not scanning the products the way they prefer it. Like, shut the f up, Lamel. I think this is a bad way to look at criticism. People telling you that the video you made is bad for valid reasons should be acknowledged. I got a lot of comments on my new video on some issues people had with it, and while I don't think every comment has valid criticism, I do self-reflect and take the criticism- I've said criticism like a fucking million times, oh my god. I change when the argument being made is valid, okay? Like me using far too many anime clips disrupting the tone of the last video. Urban Spook is under the impression that anyone giving his series criticism are, uh, excuse my French, retards who would rather spend their time tearing down an innocent creator who calls people slurs instead of talking about something they like. This obviously just made people even louder with their criticisms, and I do think it had an effect on Urban Spook's creator. Now Urban Spook's reputation is in the mud. A person who can't take criticism and made a terrible series that lives on in controversy. The cycle of negativity has no end in sight. It's fine though, AI generated take. Closing thoughts. Making something on the internet is a pretty tough thing to do, especially when so many people have seen your work. It's something I've struggled with a lot, especially when I was first starting out. So many people rejecting something you were so proud to display is a crushing feeling that I've had to deal with myself. But the way Urban Spook responded is not the way to cope. Lashing out at everyone and living in the infamy is just gonna make you miserable. If there is any lesson you should learn from Urban Spook, it's that you need to be open-minded towards criticism. Your first draft is probably not your best, and there are maybe a little bit of improvements you can make on this paragraph, like shenanigans, shenanigans really dude?